a starting point. When we think about what it will mean to live to 100 years, we have to let go of something that we've held quite dear as individuals, as a society, certainly as corporations and organizations managing workforces, and that is the phenomenon of the three-stage life. In previous generations, certainly the person at work lived a three-stage life. They started in education until around 18 or 20. They made a big step into the workforce in their early 20s, and then moved into the final third stage of retirement when they're in their late 50s, early 60s. Nice three stages. That meant that whenever someone was looking at their future, they could have a, a broad outline of what that might look like in terms of big, discrete stages. It meant that organizations, so talent leaders like yourselves, business leaders, recruitment uh, agents could also understand broadly where people would be at various points in their life in those three stages, operating generally in lockstep with their peers. But what have we been doing with this three-stage life? Well, as life expectancy has increased, we've added all of those extra years to the third stage. Every extra year of life expectancy we have gained in the last 100 years has broadly been added to that third stage of retirement. And now we're at a position where years retired and years worked are in a one-to-one -one ratio pretty much. If you work from your early 20s into your 60s and then retire from 60 till around 100, that's a one-to-one -one ratio of working life to retired life. Well, why can't that work? Well, let's think about why, well, how retirement came into being in, in the first place and what pensions really meant when they were first built. So the first incarnation of a pension scheme was around 130 years ago in Germany. It came in for people aged 70 to provide them with some financial security in their later years. What do you think the life expectancy in Germany was when the pension was introduced for 70-year-olds plus? 72. 72. That's very generous. Anyone else? 69? 48. It wasn't this dreamy saga holiday you could look forward to. This was an insurance process, just in case, and hopefully it didn't, live beyond your productive abilities. It was an insurance policy. It wasn't something people necessarily expected and planned for in the way we do today. But of course, we've added all our extra years to that third stage, and now we're at a bit of a breaking point. So how do we manage this? Well, my hypothesis is that actually we're going to break up those three stages in a way that actually is so much better for all of us. will lead to much happier, much more fulfilled, much healthier 100-year lives. We're going to have many more stages, and we're going to start seeing those three discrete stages as actually threads woven throughout our life. Education being something that isn't front-loaded necessarily, but that we see over and over again throughout our lives. Likewise, work won't have a hard start and a hard stop at 60, 65, but actually will extend much longer, perhaps into our 70s, maybe even 80s. But also that retirement block, that bit at the end that we're all working towards to one day stop working, will stop being this, this golden point. Instead, we'll weave that leisure time throughout our working lives. So how do we do this in a very successful way? Well, what I want to suggest to you today is that we need to take the same rigor that we've been applying when we manage our tangible assets, so our savings, our pensions, maybe our homes, the things that we, we really think about when we prepare for that big retirement phase, and instead think about managing with the same rigor our intangible assets. So... When I think about my bank balance, I can very clearly see when I'm depleting it, when I'm maintaining it, or on some happy weeks, I'm building it. Can I do the same with my intangible assets of productivity, vitality, and transformation? Do I know what's happening month to month, day to day, in terms of the assets that will keep me happy and healthy over a long working life? So all of us can imagine ourselves, and we'll go into these in more detail, but can imagine ourselves somewhere on these lines between productivity, maintaining perhaps, vitality, maintaining but perhaps near to depleting, 
transformation or somewhere between maintain and build. So how do we take stock of the choices we're making today and the consequences for our intangible assets that will help us continue working and continue to be fulfilled? So let's look at those three intangible assets one at a time. Productivity, what do we mean by that in terms of an individual and how can we think about that? Well, if our careers are going to be more like 50 or 60 year marathons than 30 year sprints of previous generations, it's likely that the skill set that we walk into the workforce with won't be the skill set that necessarily keeps us going to the very end of our career. In previous generations, someone could perhaps enter the accounting profession as a bookkeeper and then work their way up some nice clear rungs until the very top of the pyramid. We can see that's just not happening anymore. Partly through technology, disrupting certain levels of those career ladders, uh, particularly in bookkeeping or paralegal services, so accountancy and, and legal professions both being very visibly disrupted at the moment. But also because if we think of a long working life, how feasible is it that we just keep climbing that ladder for 50 years? So my first suggestion is that we need to think about how do we anticipate what skills will be really valuable to us in the future? Why will someone employ me in five years' time? So that means thinking about the industry you're in. How are skills, skill sets changing? How are jobs changing? And as employers, how can you give that message clearly to people in your industry, and in your organization? Or at least give them a view of one or two years ahead. This is where we see jobs growing in our company. Here's where we see jobs diminishing. Because there is a lot of anxiety at the moment, we can see in, in the data around workforces and future employment, but really the clarity needs to be about how can they map out the next couple of years? What can we tell you about the next couple of years of your career here? The second point then around productivity, how do we maintain that or well, build that throughout our life, is time for learning. We're really good at learning at the very beginning of our lives. We're great on graduate schemes. Then something happens in the middle, nothing. And then if you make it to... Um, if you make it to be on, on the board or the executive committee, if you're marked out as a high potential, you might get a bit more training then. But there's something in the middle that doesn't seem to be happening, which is this continual learning. And a lot of clients come to us and say, well, we've got a learning platform, they're just not using it. Um, we brought them on, and in the interview, they said they were really curious about loads of new skills, they're just not doing it. Um, often it comes down to things like time codes, logging your time, also, it comes down to the signaling of what really is valued in the organization. So when we think about learning, what are the signals that we're sending out as employers about how important learning is? And how much are we doing of it ourselves? So I think always a really easy to see what your life actually looks like rather than what you tell your friends it does is look at your outlook or your diary and just think, what has my life looked like over the last four or five months? Have I really made any time for learning, for investigating something new, something different? Or have I just been delivering constantly? Sometimes that's fine, but over a longer period of time, that's a risk to my productivity. I'm prioritizing productivity now at the risk of productivity in the future. And finally, in terms of productivity, having a group of peers around you who can help you navigate this. So do we have people around us in our organization, in our industry, who are also going through the same the same sort of career journey that we are that can help us, we can say, oh, you know, this is what it looks like a couple of years further down the line. This is what it looks like as someone a few years behind you, actually, and it's all looking quite different. So productivity, number one. Number two is vitality. Again, if we think about it in terms of building, maintaining, and depleting, it takes on a bit more rigor than just thinking about, oh, well, have I done my mindfulness app this evening? But it's a really important thing. And it's something that if we don't make the right choices today, we really will feel the consequences in the future. And from the conversations I have with people who dread the idea of a 100-year life, it really often comes down to this. I can't possibly still work when I'm 75. I'm feeling burnt out now from people in their 30s and 40s. So we have to fundamentally rethink what careers look like. As individuals ourselves, when we experiment with our own careers, and as employers, when we provide options and pathways. Because let's think about that career. If we're working for 50 years, we're going to need some time out. Having all of our leisure time at the end certainly won't work in that, in that marathon. 
So what do we need to do in terms of vitality? Well, first of all, thinking about, are we making time for rest and recuperation? And that doesn't necessarily mean taking a week off every six months. It could be spreading out our days in a more even way, taking sabbaticals. Are we prioritizing recuperation now so that when we get to 60, 65, 70, we may actually want to continue working because actually retirement, despite some of the, the myths around it, isn't necessarily the best thing for our health. A lot of people want to carry on working into old age, just not in an up or out model, just not with the same level of stress and responsibility. So can we rethink the sequencing, the pacing of our working lives? And do we have employers who will be supportive of that? The other element in vitality is, again, around a network. Who around us will help us maintain our vitality over a longer working life? Well, these are friends, friends and family. And it's so interesting to see friendship on the agenda with Margaret Heffernan later this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to that session because it's actually a conversation we're having much more with big corporations is, do the people in your organization have time to nurture their friendships? Remember that people are going through this multi-stage life where they're doing things that are very different to their peers. They're not all working in the same lockstep as before, perhaps. So taking a lot more responsibility for the planning and navigating of their own, own lives and transitions, facing much more disruption in terms of skill sets. So need the energy and vitality to, to take this on. And actually, when we've done research within organizations about why people leave, particularly in the younger cohorts, the feedback we get is, actually, it's, it's because I don't have enough time to keep my friendships going. And interestingly, when we've asked people in a, um, one of the big four professional services firms, what is the biggest barrier to your work-life balance, to your ability to have the life you want, they didn't say long hours. They said that long hours was something they expected in that kind of organization, but unpredictable long hours was a real problem. Because if you cancel on football one Wednesday at the last minute, your friends are a bit pissed off. If you cancel the second week running, they're really annoyed. And by the fifth week running, you don't have any friends left. And that's the reality of it. So, and of course, that affects people in work. The idea that you can have a good work life without a very good home or out of work life, is, we all know is a myth. So are we taking time ourselves to build those regenerative friendships? And are we also enabling other people to do the same? And then finally, transformation. So this is a relatively new one. As we said, in previous generations, two big transformations into work and then out of work, and doing it broadly with people the same age as you because there weren't as many options. But now we have many more options, many more paths to navigate and much more disruption. So we need to get better at change. And change is really taxing for an organization. For anyone who's been in an organizational change program will know, and I can see some smiling faces already. It's really taxing for an organization to go through change. It's also really, really taxing for an individual to do the same. So how do we help people understand what it takes to make a successful transition? Well, first of all, it's about self-knowledge. To be able to transition out of your industry, out of your profession, into something new, you have to know what, what drives you, what you really love, what you enjoy, which means having diverse experiences. It also means having a diverse network. So the first two network types that we talked about in productivity and vitality, your close friends and the people in your industry, they won't help you transform into something completely new and different. They're just too similar to you. Actually, you need a diverse network, a group of people who think differently to you, who can show you a possible future self. And we talk about this a lot in organizations, about diversity of thought. Do we have diverse candidates, diverse profiles in the organization? Well, I'll put that question back to you as an individual. How much diversity do you have around you that shows you different ways of being? Do you know someone in a different industry altogether who can say, this is what it looks like to be a dancer? You may never be a dancer, but you could learn something. So how diverse are our networks, and will they help us get there? So my challenge to you today is to think about, in the same way as you think about your finances, the same rigor that we apply to those metrics, think about what's happening with my intangible assets. If you had to plot yourself on that chart, where would you be now? Where might your teams be? And it's okay to be in this situation now, but in six months' time, 
if you're still depleting the same asset. You might want to have a, a rethink. You know? At times, we are pushing for promotion. So you know what? Vitality is going to go down. Productivity might go up. As long as we're factoring in that that has consequences and we need to rebalance at some point, that's fine. But start thinking in that way about your intangible assets. And then, what will I do differently? Well, the lesson of having lots of children certainly won't be my, my way of approaching this, as much as it would be lovely. But I will take the number one lesson that I think my grandmother really teaches me, and that is the continuous learning. So she passed her German GCSE at the age of 65. She passed her driving test at the age of 76. <laughs> I passed mine last week. Um, no big deal. Uh, but yeah, so I think the continuous thirst for learning is something that she has definitely taught me. And with or without the 14 children, I will certainly be taking that away. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stand here? Fantastic, thank you. Well, um, I, I tried to text my wife to say 14 kids. It, it didn't go down well. Um, yes, I hard work. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> it didn't go down well. Um, my, my, actually, my best man was from Myanmar. I, I think it's got a lot to do with the food as well, actually. Um, yeah. And she does talk about... Any questions from the audience for, for Emma? Any questions? While they're, oh, we're looking around the room as the lights come up, of the three that were there, transformational was the one that I would probably need most help with. Yeah. What are the, some of the things in terms of building from a transformational perspective that you see work, working well within individuals? So at the individual level, I think it's, it's staying curious and experimenting with other, other things, other interests. I think the worst advice anyone ever gets given is follow your passion. Yep. Who's got one? <laughs> um, it's true. But if you follow your curiosity, something you're just a little bit curious about, that, that can lead you somewhere different. So I, I was curious about improvisational theater. Who's curious about that? But I was curious about improvisational theater about two, three years ago. I was like, I've always wanted to do a bit of acting. Um, had no relation to work, but just tried it out. And, ooh, and because I tried it out, um, it became an interest. You know, it, it introduced you to different people, different ways of thinking. So if there's something you've always been curious about, just do it, just do that. And for lots of the individuals in the room have quite diverse teams. And one of the things that was on there around productivity, we know that deadlines and P&Ls and targets are, are even more prominent in terms of our working life now. How can a, a forward-thinking human resources leader be encouraging their teams not to deplete their resources and mm. actually increase and actually build on what they have? Yes, I think that's a fascinating question. I think the, the hard fact of it is you've got to be role modeling it yourself. And I don't mean role modeling at the very, very top level because yeah. Yeah. really high level role models don't really work. Sheryl Sandberg being a COO doesn't make me feel like I can be a COO. But my, my boss is a, is a woman and she's a CEO. So I think, oh, that's, you know, that's close enough. So you've got to have role models that are close enough to the people. And I think the challenge in HR always is that the policies that we create are not enacted by the people by the people who create them. They're enacted by other people in the organization several layers down. Mm. And having, ensuring that line managers, every line manager is able to reveal, you know, I'm learning. You know, can, we, can they show that they're learning? Can they show that they've taken time out to do that? They've gone home early one day. So, yeah, make it visible. Live that example. Any questions from anyone in the audience? I'm trying to make sure I don't miss anyone with the opportunity. Everyone's Fantastic. panicking about the 100 year life. They are, they are thinking, <laughs> how, do, how do they maintain? How do they maintain? Yeah, Please, right. ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Emma Birch from Hotspots Movement. Thank you. Thank you.